Hi guys, this is a short training uh, on using uh, Verilog for FPGA based design. So we'll be covering uh, in different blocks. First block, uh, in the first block, uh, I'll cover logic design. Uh, basically it won't be a full fledged logic design, but it will be a review of uh, what basic building blocks we use in the logic design process. Uh, we'll cover a couple of design examples to refresh your uh, ways of uh, designing stuff and then we'll start Verilog. In Verilog, we'll, uh, we'll cover basic building blocks, modules, gears, marks, demarks, registers, and how data values are used and we'll do a coding example. Uh, this will be followed by, uh, by Verilog for simulation, which is kind of different from Verilog for synthesis. That, that, that's the first part. Uh, and in that part, we'll be writing test bench, and we'll be writing, uh, we'll be running simulations. Uh, then we'll try to uh, synthesize the design that we we have uh, made. When when we are certain that this is working fine, then we'll actually port it on on an FPGA and test it. And uh, then there'll be another section on state machines. So this is the first presentation. So that that will be covering the first block that is logic design review. Okay. So uh, normally we used uh, this term register transfer level or RTL uh, in multiple meanings. Uh, one meaning is that when we say that we have an RTL level diagram of a design. Another thing is that when we say that uh, RTL is ready, then then normally we what we mean is that we have all written the Verilog code uh, or tested it. So uh, so Verilog or VHDL are uh, two popular languages. Will be will only be covering Verilog in this in this section. So what are the basic building blocks in logic design? Uh, basically when we say we have a rtl level diagram available uh, we mean a diagram that comprises of roughly uh, these components it, and it can use gates multiplexers t multiplexers uh, registers or memories uh, and then address subtractors or multipliers and we can have straight machines uh, or any combination of above uh, so what are gates? Uh, these are the common symbols used for the gates. If you remember correctly, this first one is called AND gate. AND gate outputs one if all of the inputs are one. If any of the input is zero, output will be zero. Uh, this is called OR gate. Uh, OR gate uh, outputs one if any of the input is one. So this is uh, that means if uh, any one input is one and rest of the inputs are zero, it will output one. If all of them are one, it will still output one. It will only output zero if all of the inputs are zero. So similarly, in the AND gate, uh, if a, uh, in AND gate, if any of the input is zero, output will be zero. Uh, this is called XOR gate. This is very similar to OR gate, but uh, normally XOR gate has two inputs and uh, it outputs one uh, if only one of them is one. So if one is one and the other is zero or other is one or this is zero, then output will, will be one. Uh, uh, but unlike uh, OR gate, if both inputs are one, uh, XOR gate will not output one. It, it, it only outputs one if exclusively only one input is one. This is symbol for NOT gate. Sometimes we'll use this symbol. Sometimes we only insert this circle that we normally call a bubble. We just uh, we insert a bubble, and we uh, by, by that we mean uh, there is a NOT operation going on. Uh, there can be a bubble in front of AND, OR, or XOR. Uh, in that case, we call it NAND, NOR, or uh, or XOR. Uh, that means that uh, the output is uh, uh, passing through a NOT gate. Okay, next thing that we use is a register. A register can store bits. Normally it has n bit input and it has n bit output and it can store that input for one clock cycle. So clock is a, uh, is a generally uh, a tick that is going on. Uh, it's a basically uh, oscillating signal that is one and zero, one and zero, one and zero. So uh, we normally work on rising edge of a clock or a falling edge of a clock by rising edge, we mean that when the transition is from zero to one, 
or by falling edge what we mean that uh, if the transition is from 1 to 0 most of the circuits work on rising edge of the clock but at times we use falling of the edge of the clock as well so let me explain with the diagram uh, normally there is also a reset signal which uh, sets its initial value to to a known state normally it's zero so uh, what we do is that uh, clock clock is a signal that is going on 101010 so this is called a timing diagram uh, from left to right time uh, is increasing so clock is one for a while then it is zero then it is one then it will be zero then it is one so let's say we have uh, at the input value three so by this these two lines and three we mean that at these end bits uh, the binary value of three is input so for example if if, if it is um, seven down to zero that is eight bits so then uh, the value will be zero 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 one one so uh, so if, the, uh, if there is three at the input and if this is working on the rising edge of a clock, then when this rising edge of a clock comes, the output will be three. So before that, we don't know the output because we don't know what was the input at the uh, previous value. So we are uh, showing it by X. By X, we generally mean we don't care what, what was the value before that. We have, we have started looking at the values uh, from this rising edge of a clock. So if in the next cycle I input a value of 4, then at that rising edge of a clock, since input is 4, the output will be 4. Similarly, in, in the next input, uh, next cycle, if the input is 5, so at this rising edge of a clock, input is 5, so in the subsequent cycle, output will be 5. So this is the common working of a register that it stores the value at input for the next clock cycle. If the value at input was three, it, it will be stored. If it was four, then four will be stored for one complete cycle. In between, if the value changes, it doesn't matter. But before uh, a small amount of time that we can call setup time before that clock edge, then the value has to be stable and that value will be stored in the uh, in the register. We often call it that that value is latched in that register. Okay. Uh, Similarly, uh, very often we use another signal called enable with the register. So what enable does is that uh, that if this register will work only when this enable signal uh, is one. So for example, uh, if we say that uh, at this clock edge we have uh, this enable signal to be one, so that means that before uh, before this clock edge uh, in the rest of clock edges. Uh, we didn't have this enable signal one so that means that uh, the value won't be stored in the register so register will retain its old value whatever it was so only at the clock edge when enable is one uh, the value will be stored so this gives this register capability to uh, store values indefinitely so for example if we stored a value here it, it might be a result of any computation and we might need it uh, maybe uh, three four seconds uh, uh, later so that means that that could potentially mean millions or billions of clock cycles uh, afterwards uh, because this clock is generally very very fast uh, on fpgas we are generally talking about 100 mega cycles per second uh, and on on uh, a6 it can uh, go to in giga uh, cycles per second so so a few seconds is a large amount of time from uh, uh, from digital design perspective so if we need uh, this value after a couple of seconds then we need to store it for uh, uh, for a while so if we don't assert enable uh, for that uh, for that while this file file will be stored in this register okay so next uh, component is a multiplexer a multiplexer uh, works this way that uh, we have multiple inputs and and, and a select line for example, if there are four inputs, then this select line will be uh, two bits. So what it does is it selects the input to be forwarded at the output. For, for example, if the input is zero, uh, this will be connected to output. If input is one, this will be connected to the output. So and so on. Uh, so it can be uh, three inputs, four inputs, whatever we want. So this is working of a mux. Sometimes we call it a select line. Sometimes we also call it an address. 
the opposite component of mux is called a dmux. Dmux works this way that uh, based on select line, if select line is zero, we connect this input to this output and connect rest of the outputs to zero. If select line is one, we connect it to the next in, uh, next output. If it's two, we connect it to next output and so on. So, uh, so this is called demultiplexer or dmux uh, in short. Uh, so uh, these are the more uh, commonly used components. There are more to follow, but uh, I'll do a small example here. For example, a very common component used in digital circuits is called register file. Register file means that we have a set of registers on which we want to store some value. So for example, uh, I I have some some registers. Uh, let's let's assume these are eight or sixteen registers. So uh, what we do is we have a single data out uh, and what we want to do is we take as an address as an input for example if address is zero we want that this register should be connected to output if, uh, if it is one then we want this register to be connected to the output uh, if it's two we want this register to be connected and so on so what do you think will be the component that we should use here pause the video for a moment and then uh, resume it when you come up with the answer so if you um, if you have thought it through, then it should be a mux that should uh, uh, that that will do the job. So if address is zero, this register will be forwarded. If address is one, uh, this register will be forwarded, and so on. Similarly, in a register file, we want uh, to write on the registers as well. So what we want is that whenever at a rising edge of a clock, this write signal is asserted. Uh, then we want to write on any of the register. And what we want to write, uh, we give it as an input, uh, we call it data in. So, uh, so if the address is zero, we want this data to be written on register number zero. If the, uh, if the address is one, we want to write this data to register number one, and so on uh, until the rest of the registers. So uh, pause the video uh, and then think about it. What could be the circuit to do the job? So I'll resume it later. Okay, so if you have think about, uh, thought about it, then uh, the best approach to do is to broadcast the data to all registers and to demux the write signal to all the registers as an enable signal. So what it means is that uh, if we want to write 10 at location number three, so I'll input 10 at all the registers, but uh, since the write signal is used as an enable so only enable of register number three will be asserted and enables of rest of the registers won't be asserted so since the uh, enable won't be asserted uh, so those registers won't be written so it doesn't matter if uh, they get the wrong data because it won't be written anyway so uh, so this is a common mistake maybe if you thought about it if you used uh, only one dmux at times people use dmux on the data line so this is a very common mistake that we made and that was the whole purpose of this design example okay so this register file also gives um, a conceptual model of a memory as well so when we talk about memories in on fpgas so the, uh, what we mean is that we want to give an address and a write signal and a data in signal and we want to write to that uh, to that address it's slightly different and then reg file it generally has a delay of one clock cycle but it gives a good conceptual model uh, and normally it's not uh, memory is not implemented as a reg file it's generally implemented differently but conceptually you can think of it as a uh, as a small memory and a, on a larger memories that that we generally call block rams on fpga behave similarly only with one difference that we have uh, one cycle delay uh, in the output okay in addition to uh, to multiplex uh, demultiplexes, we also can use adders, subtractors uh, in our design. So uh, generally, if we have n inputs, then the output is generally one bit higher than that because uh, if we add two maximum numbers in n bits, we'll we'll get a number that is uh, that cannot be stored in n bits. It has to be stored in n plus one bits. Many a times we can ignore that if we know that our output will be within range then in that case, we can have output of n bits as well. Uh, normally, adder subtractor can be designed uh, combined as well, so, so that we have a, a control signal that asserts. Uh, uh, when asserted, it can subtract. If it is deasserted, uh, we can uh, subtract it. 
Uh, additionally, we can have uh, option to saturate output as well. So if we have, uh, if we don't have uh, n plus one bits, we only have n bits. So we can have an extra logic, uh, some extra logic to make sure that if output is going out of the way, then we cap it to the maximum value instead of uh, having a random number at the output. Similarly, multiplier multiplies two numbers, and normally, if we multiply two n bit numbers, uh, the output can be of two n bits. So again, there are options to have signed and unsigned multipliers, and again, we have option to saturate it. Um, so these are the, the, uh, the generally building blocks that we use. Uh, so so <coughs> uh, so now we uh, do a couple of examples. Uh, we first start with a simple example, which is a simple decrementer capable of counting numbers. Uh, on, on clock cycles, uh, you can imagine it uh, like a traffic signal. So on a traffic signal, we, we have a down counter that uh, keeps uh, counting down till we reach uh, zero. So we want to make that kind of a uh, decrementer and then we'll cover another uh, a little bit complex example uh, that is a 4D FIPO. So what is a decrementer? First of all, when we want to design something, we make a black box and we write all the inputs and outputs. And then we think of it, what can be done uh, about it and how can we design it? So now, uh, since you already know all the building blocks, we'll be using only those building blocks to uh, try to make this uh, decrementer. So uh, what we want to do is that uh, we want to have uh, a value of count and we want to have a load signal that if I assert load for, for a clock cycle on the, that rising edge of the clock, I want to save the value, uh, uh, save an initial value in the counter. So let's say I assert load and I save the value 100 in the counter. And then I want to, uh, whenever I want to decrement it, I, I, I want to assert the decrement signal. For example, uh, if it's a traffic light, then I can uh, load a value of, let's say if it waits for 60 seconds, I can load initial value of 60. So I'll assert load. Uh, and at the same time, apply a 60 at initial value. So that will be loaded in the counter. So we'll have output 60 at that moment. Then after every second, I can assert decrement for one cycle. And on that rising edge of clock, it will be decremented by one. Uh, so it will be uh, 59 in the next second and so on uh, until it gets to zero. And that, that value we can uh, see at the count. So what do you think we can, uh, can be done? Uh, you can pause the video and think about it. Uh, I will. I can give you a hint first. Uh, that uh, normally, how I design these circuits, I just first put whatever thing is necessary to be uh, without which we cannot design the circuit. So when I put it there, uh, then I think of it that what can be added next and what can be added next, and that that way I just draw it. So pause the video and think about it. Okay, so so uh, this is how I would design it. So first of all, I I need something to store the values. So I definitely need a register in there. So that that's the first thing. Next thing, when I think about it, I need to store this initial value in this register. So so that is one thing I just, that need to be stored in it. But it's not only this initial value. I also want to store the decremented value. The decremented value will be from the same register and it will be decremented. So this minus minus uh, means that I want to decrement it by one. Uh, so since there are two values that I want to store uh, in this register, but register is only one input. So if there are multiple options and we want to select between them, we generally use a max. So I'll, I'll add a max here. So that will select whether I want to uh, store the initial value or whether I want to store the decremented value. So when we add a max, so this max is selecting between two uh, things. So it has a select line. So what will be the select line? So, uh, so pause the video and think about it again. Okay. So about the select line, what we can do is we can simply tie it to decrement. So if the decrement is one, I can uh, take this input, and if decrement is zero, then I can load the initial value. But it will it won't work fine because let's say uh, uh, on one second boundary I decremented it, but as soon as the decrement signal is low, it will 
uh, write down the initial value gain. So we, we decremented it from 60 to 59 for a cycle. But in the next cycle, since the decrement will be zero, uh, initial value will, will be loaded again that we don't want. So what we can do is we, can, we have to control when we want to write on this register. Uh, so we have to do, uh, do two things. First is to select things, but also we have to control when we want to write on this register. We don't want to write on this register on every cycle. So if we don't want to uh, write on a register on every cycle, that means that register needs an enable signal. So we have to have an enable. And if we do it correctly, what we can do is we only want to enable this register if there is a decrement signal or a load signal. So so as I am saying it, that we only want to enable it if there is a decrement signal or there is a load signal. So that or in the statement also gives you a hint that we can use an or gate. So if we do that, then if there is a load signal or a decrement signal, this enable will be uh, asserted. And since, uh, so if the decrement, if, if this was asserted due to decrement, this side will be uh, connected. If it was uh, in, uh, it was selected due to load signal, then decrement will be zero at the time and this value will be selected. Uh, there is a chance to have a decrement and a load on the same clock cycle, so we haven't handled it in this case in this uh, specific design. But what we can do is we can use an XOR gate as uh, for that case, and in that case, if there is a load and a decrement at the same time, we won't enable the circuit, so the value will remain whatever it is. But it depends how we want to actually uh, what circuit we are using it in. Maybe in, uh, we want to prioritize decrement over load. Maybe we want to prioritize uh, load over decrement. If we want to prioritize load over decrement, then instead of decrement, we want uh, we will want to connect load signal to the mux. And then if that is one, we'll uh, write this side, and otherwise we'll write this. Okay. So now let's do another example. So by now. Uh, uh, you, your mu uh, brain muscles might have flexed a little bit, so let's let's do another example and flex them a little bit more. So we want to make a 4D FIFO. So what is so what is a FIFO? FIFO uh, takes uh, uh, so FIFO is a common term in computer science. We have push and pop signals. When there is a push signal, we want to uh, store this data in this FIFO. And when there is a pop signal, we want to bring out the, the data that was stored first in, in the FIFO. FIFO stands for first in, first out. So whatever value was written first, it will be output first. So, uh, so what we want is, for example, we want to store 100 in, uh, in the in the FIFO, so I'll assert a push signal and push at 100 here. That will be stored in the FIFO. Then I want to uh, uh, store 500. I'll, I'll push uh, again and uh, give a value of 500. So FIFO will have two values, 100 and 500. So uh, if I want to pop it, so the, la uh, the first value that was uh, written was 100. So add that out, always it should be the value that was written first. So if I pop it, that means that I have read that value and now I can read the next value. So if I assert pop signal, that means that that 100 is already read out. So in the next cycle, the value that should be output should be 500 and so on. So by 4D, we mean that uh, we can at max store four values uh, in the FIFO. So if there are four pushes and there is no pop, that means that we, uh, we can't push anymore. Uh, and since this is a simple design, we don't handle that case, but we would say that whoever is pushing has to make sure that he doesn't push if, if the FIFO is full. So we, we assert FIFO full signal if we have four consecutive pushes without pop. But if there is a pop, then that means there are three values stored, then we can push again uh, and so on. If there is uh, if the FIFO is empty, then there should be it shouldn't be any pop uh, on the FIFO because there is no data available. So if there is a FIFO empty asserted, uh, which will be at the start, and whenever uh, we have popped out all values, then uh, then then pop should not be asserted. So think about it. What could be the design options? Yeah, pause for a moment and think about. It. Okay. So uh, again, when I think about it we need at least four registers to store the values. There can be multiple design options, but one way to design is that I always push this way. So I connect data in with first register uh, and the data out of first register to data in a second and so on, till the four registers are there. 
So whenever I push a data, that data will be written on this register. The data that was written in this register will be moved to the next and the next and next and the data uh, written in the last register will be lost. Since at the start, we don't need any data. So what we initialize them with zeros and uh, uh, this value can be overwritten. We don't care about it because there was no data in the FIFO. But if four pushes have been done, then, la uh, then first value will be here, second will be here, third will be here, fourth will be here. So uh, to write it, uh, right side is pretty simple. Uh, we just need to write everything whenever there is a push. So we can, do we need an enable signal here? Think about it. Yes, we do, because we only want to push when there is a push signal. So uh, so we can push, we can use push as an enable signal of the uh, of this register. Okay, so this, uh, this right side was simple. How can we read from it? Uh, so for example, uh, uh, for example, if uh, I have written three values, one is stored here, one is there, one is there. So the first value will be here. But if I had I had written only two values, that value would have been here. If I had only pushed one value, that would have been here. So that means I need to be able to read from here, 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 and here. So I have to uh, read from four different uh, locations. So that means uh, I need to connect this data out with uh, with any one of them depending on how many times I have pushed the data. So when we have multiple inputs and we want to connect it to one output, what do we use? That's right, we use a max. So uh, so we, um, we use a max that can select between four inputs. So that means it will be two select lines because with two bits, we can have values 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, that is 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, but how can we select this? Select line, how do we know that whether we want to read from here, here, or here, or here? It depends on how many times we have pushed it. And it also depends on whether we popped some data or not. For example, I, if I had pushed four times, then data will be here. So I should have uh, one, zero, one, two, three. So I, 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 would, I would want this to be at the output. But if there is uh, there has been a pop, in between then that value will be here so we want some kind of counter here that can count pushes as well as pops but we want to increment on push and we want to decrement on pop uh, so that counter can also give us signals that if it is four then five is full and if it is zero then five is empty uh, so that that's that's kind of the design that rdl level design that we are looking into so but we haven't designed this counter yet so uh, rest of the logic is pretty much designed. This is a comparator. These are registers and muxes. So uh, how how about this counter? So uh, so we want to board a counter. You have already made a counter, the decrementary example in the decrementary example. So in this example, we don't want to load an initial value. We want, we want to start at zero. And whenever there is an increment, we want to increment it. And whenever there is a decrement, we want to decrement it. Again, we need a register that holds the count value. And we want to decrement as well as increment it. So we need a decrementer as well as an incrementer. And since we have, we want to store one of those values, so we also need a max, just like in the previous example. And again, uh, the select line can be increment, and we have we can have an enable that only if there is an increment or decrement, then we we can uh, enable this register. So if the increment is one, so this value would be written. If decrement is one, this value is written. If both are zero, then by default, decremented value will be selected because if select line is zero, but it won't be written because uh, because if both inputs are zero, enable will be deserted. So now we have designed the counter as well. So so again, uh, what I want to show with these examples is that uh, that until we have this level of design diagram available. We don't write viral of course. We have to reach the state un uh, unless we have this design diagram. If we don't do that, uh, we'll make mistakes and we'll be writing in a software style and that doesn't work in hardware. Uh, so you have to uh, come out of this mentality of writing software because uh, Verilog is a language, but it's a hardware description language. Uh, whatever we write describes hardware. So I have seen codes where people uh, have uh, written spaghetti code that doesn't uh, that runs in simulation but doesn't run on FPGA because they haven't gone through the design pro uh, design process correctly. Okay, 
So, uh, in addition to uh, the components that we design, there uh, there also exists a library of components, common components that that are uh, used. Uh, uh, we generally call them IP cores. For example, FIR filter. If we are using as uh, we doing a signal processing example, FFT core, also for signal processing, error correction codes for. Uh, if we are working on communication systems, similarly, there are image processing libraries available as well. So there's a, there's a lot of components that are available uh, uh, in open source domain as well as uh, in form of IP cores that are ready to use, that are blocks that you, you only need to study the document, how they work, and then interface with those uh, things. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, in the next uh, section I'll cover uh, how to write viral of code. Okay, now in this uh, second uh, second module, uh, we'll be covering viral of syntax. We'll we'll start with the, uh, but we'll be covering uh, viral of for senses, and then we'll be covering viral of for simulation. Uh, so first of all, uh, we'll be covering viral of for synthesis. That means that uh, the code that we write will be transformed into uh, into the components that we covered in the uh, first uh, section, uh, first block of the this training. So we'll start with modules. Uh, uh, in viral of module is a reasonable size replicatable block. For example, whatever component that you think that you'll need to uh, use again, it's a good idea to uh, make it a module. For example, uh, you can think of it as a just like uh, if, if you design your logic on breadboard and you use the ICs. So those ICs are replicatable components. You have you can have ICs of the same kind, many ICs of the same kind, and you can use that. Similarly, we can have a, a module and we can reuse it uh, again and again. For example, in the last examples, the counter or decrementer or FIFO that we design can be used as modules because they can be used in multiple uh, uh, situations uh, okay so uh, for example we want to write code for for fifo so uh, so what we'll do is we we make a text file and change its extension to dot p uh, and we'll give it a name for example fifo.p and we just write down the inputs and outputs. So in FIFO, we had data in push, pop, data out, FIFO full, and FIFO empty signals. So in that file, uh, we start by writing module space name of the module. Uh, in this case, it's FIFO. And then we have parenthesis start and parenthesis end, followed by a semicolon. And then we have end module. In, in these parenthesis, we write uh, the here we write the inputs and outputs, and here we write uh, code for uh, modeling very long, uh, modeling the FIFO. Uh, so what we do is we just write inputs and outputs. That, that's the port list. Uh, so if if something is input, we write input. If something is output, we write output. And this is a comma separated list. Uh, list that means that uh, in the last uh, thing we don't we won't have a comma. And uh, if something is one bit wide, we don't write anything. And if uh, it is it comprises of multiple bits, for example, if we have 16 bit data, we'll write it 15 colon 0. We read it 15 down to 0. So that means 0, 1, 2, up to 15 will be 16 bits. So in this case, we are assuming that our FIFO was 16 bit, uh, uh, can store 16 bit data. Support. Okay. So, uh, so this can be a module, and then we'll write code uh, for modeling FIFO here. Uh, before we write code for FIFO, I want to go into uh, how modules are used. For example, if uh, we if we want to have uh, to implement this logic design diagram, so this diagram also has this counter here. So this counter can be a separate module as well. If we think that we, we need to have a up down counter, uh, we'll be using an up down counter later on. So we can write another module counter with inputs increment, decrement and count is the output. So uh, so how would we use that counter in our FIFO? That's, that's what I want to explain here. So let's say I am writing this code for FIFO and assume that I have already written code for counter. So what I have said is that we the counter uh, is kind of every module is kind of a chip and we want just like we uh, place that chip on a breadboard we can 
uh, instantiate that that module in our code uh, for FIFO. So that's how we instantiate it. So this uh, so writing this code means that we have uh, made an instance of that counter. So what we do is we first of all write the name of the module that we want to instantiate. So name is counter. Then we give instance a name. For example, counter instance one, uh, or I can give it another any name that I want. Then we tie the ports that are here, increment, decrement, and count with the ports in 5.4. For example, if you remember the design, increment needed to be connected to push signal, decrement needed to be connected to pop signal, and count needed to be connected to count. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's the same name or a different name because we are now inside this module and that is 5.4.v. Uh, so we can connect it to them. And uh, these uh, things will be generally declared as wire or red. We'll, we'll uh, discuss later on how how we declare these things. So if we had uh, two counters, so we didn't have two counters in this case, but if we had two counters, then we can have another instance with, with some, uh, some something like this. Okay, so if we have two counters, then we, uh, we can instantiate two counts and then we can have different signals. Uh, if, we want to, if we want to increment, decrement, uh, we can have some common signals, then we can have some common, it, it will depend on the design that we are making. In this design, we only need one counter. But we, uh, what I wanted to show was that we can have multiple instances, multiple counts, just like we had multiple um, chips on on uh, on a breadboard of same type. So yeah, so that's it. So we only need one counter. So that's how we instantiate a module. So in summary, module is a uh, is a block that can be uh, that can be reused uh, and uh, replicated. So now we come to writing Verilog code uh, for what's inside the block inside the module. So we'll we'll cover. Uh, basic building blocks and how we write code for each of the building blocks. So these were the basic building blocks that we covered: gates, muxes, demuxes, registers, uh, memories, arithmetic operations, and state machines. Uh, so what we are trying to do here is that we are using words and characters um, uh, written in the in a file, and that characters will infer some uh, some hardware when we synthesize it. And it will model that hardware when we simulate it, when we will try to run uh, the code in simulation on our computer. So if we want to uh, model a gate, uh, we normally use always at static, and then we use begin end. And if we want to make an end gate, we use A is equal to B and C and D. So uh, just uh, those who already know C, uh, uh, know that in C, this ampersand sign is used for end. So in Verilog, it's also used for AND, uh, and it works in exactly the same way. It's uh, bitwise AND uh, by default, uh, and uh, if we use double AND, it will be logical AND, but normally we don't use logical AND uh, when we are designing logic. Similarly, for OR, we'll be using uh, this bar symbol that we use in C. Uh, for XOR, we use this cap signal, uh, that uh, symbol that, uh, that will XOR multiple things. For not, we use tilde sign. So, uh, so these are all bitwise operators in this case. Uh, uh, this uh, this begin and you can think of it as uh, brackets in C, uh, starting curly bracket and ending curly bracket. And this all always at static is that is something that we always use. That that's that's called a procedural assignment, but it doesn't matter what we call it. Uh, uh, you you should all almost always use this. Next thing is multiplexer. So, so that means whenever there is a gate, we can use this index and it will infer a gate. So if we want to uh, make a multiplexer, uh, then we again use always the static begin end. So that's brackets. And then just like in C, we have a switch case statement. In Verilog, we have only a case statement. In we uh, put a case and uh, parentheses, we uh, put the name of select line uh, signal. So in case, in this case, it's address. Uh, and then we, uh, to end the case, we have to put an end case. And then we write this kind of syntax. Ig ignore uh, this two tick D at the moment. Uh, what we, we are doing is that we are 0, 1, 2, and 3. We are saying that out will be connected to A if, in, uh, if select line is 0. Uh, out will be connected to B 
uh, assume that this is a b c and d so so this this is the syntax that we if the select line is zero we can act it out with a if it's one we can act to b and c and d so on so now what is this two tick d zero thing so this is the way verilog stores the data values so uh, if we write a tick b uh, four zeros underscore one zero one zero so this eight means uh, it's the width of the bus this tick is ignored this b means we are writing the value in binary format it, they can, there are four options we can write it in binary octal decimal or hexadecimal uh, then these are the values and uh, among the values we can use underscore as well that will be ignored but it is very useful especially when when we are looking into bit fields and we want to see uh, let's say in a 32 bit number bit 13 and 15 uh, separately and 19 and 20 separately then we can put uh, underscores to uh, differentiate different bits uh, so unlike c we can add underscores inside the numbers so uh, even if i write this uh, it take b 1010 that that means that it will be an 8 bit bus with this value at the input that is uh, uh, one uh, two ones and rest of the values will be zero uh, if I write this way or if I write it tick D10, it will mean the same thing. Uh, it will be internally translated into binary and binary of 10 is 1010 that we, we saw in the previous value. Also, if I write it tick H8, it will also mean the same thing. At times, we use access in these values. Uh, access means don't care. For example, uh, in a, a mux, if we uh, want to uh, place some values as don't care that we don't care whether this bit is 0 or 1 then we can use uh, x so but we can only use it in hex or uh, binary okay so uh, now similarly we can uh, write code for dmux uh, for dmux we also use always that static begin and just like the cases uh, before that and then we have similar structure uh, with case and, and two to be zero and so on with end case uh, but here we have a, a little bit of different syntax uh, and it's not necessary that we use this syntax I'll, I'll tell you uh, another way as well but i also wanted to co cover concatenation how how this statement is written so this is called concatenation for example uh, so this is a separate example to explain what concatenation is that will uh, make you understand the last slide again let's say we have a uh, four bit signal a 3 bit signal B, 1 bit signal C, and I want to connect it to let's say 14 bit data bus. Uh, but I want to connect it this way that I want to have uh, 4 uh, a bits of A in the MSBs, then 3 bits of Bs next, and 4 zeros, and then C is replicated 3 times. So what we do in Verilog is that we, if we want to concatenate things this way, we uh, put a curly bracket and we write data in is equal to and then curly, within the curly brackets, uh, whatever we write left to right will be connected, uh, concatenated left to right. For example, if I want A and B, then I will write A comma B, uh, followed by I want to have four zeros. So for four zeros, I will have to write four tick D zero that or B zero or whatever zero, hex zero. Uh, but it means that there, there are four bits which are zero and then i have to replicate c three times if i want to replicate it I, i'll have to uh, put c in curly brackets write three outside it and then put another uh, set of curly bra uh, braces so that means that uh, i'll be replicating c three times and this statement will mean uh, that the connections will be correctly made so now if we look at this uh, logic that uh, i have written here so what i uh, am saying is that this input is in and a b c and d are the outputs uh, uh, so if a b c and d are the outputs what i am saying is that assign a b c d in such a way that we have in first and then we have three zeros that means that in will be connected to a and then three zeros will be connected to b c and d it is important to connect zeros to the rest uh, of the outputs as well because that's what will happen if we uh, if uh, if we want to make a dmux if we don't connect it that will infer a latch that we never want that that will mean that these outputs won't be asserted 
uh, if I only write in A is equal to in here, that means that we haven't uh, asserted B, C, and D that, that will indicate to compiler that we want to hold the previous value and in that case, it will make a combinational feedback that we never want. Similarly, in the next line, we have uh, written that we want to connect in such a way that first value will be zero, so A will be connected to zero, then B will be connected to in, and that will be followed by two zeros, and so on for the rest of the values. Okay, so that's that's how it works. Uh, it's perfectly okay if we if instead of writing this syntax, if we write begin and end. Uh, so begin and end means uh, if we have more than one statement, then we put. Uh, just like we put curly brackets in C, so we put, put begin and in, uh, into typically zero. And here we write A is equal to in, B is equal to zero, C is equal to zero, D is equal to zero. And uh, in two tick T1, we again put begin and, and now we put B is equal to in and put rest of the values to zero and so on. It will still work fine. It, uh, it will infer a D max um, as usual. Okay, so next component that we studied was uh, register. Uh, and if we want to uh, model a register, uh, again, we use always at, but not, not static this time. We use always at pause edge clock if we want uh, our register to work on rising edge of a clock. And if we want to work it on uh, falling edge of a clock, then we use neg edge clock. Normally, most of the times, we use pause edge clock unless we are um interfacing with something outside the fpga then we normally uh, use negative of clock as well uh, another change in syntax is that instead of equal to we have this uh, we call this non-blocking assignment this is kind of an arrow symbol that less than equal to uh, symbol kind of an arrow symbol this is called non-blocking assignment so if i want to make a register uh, with these names then i'm saying that if there is a reset signal, uh, then reg out should be zero. So that output should be zero. Otherwise, register should be, have the value of whatever the value is here. So on every rising edge of clock, this reg out will either be zero if reset is asserted, or it will uh, input the value of uh, whatever value is at, at the input. If we have an enabled signal as well, just like, uh, so first of all, we have to uh, remember that registers is, is inferred only if we use always at pause edge or neg edge clock. And, and when we do that, we should always use non-blocking assignment instead of a blocking assignment. In, in the previous examples, we always use blocking assignment. So if we don't use that, there can be differences in your simulation and actual senses. Uh, because this will uh, uh, this will not model uh, registers properly if there is a uh, there is a non-blocking assignment. If there is an enable signal as well, then we can use else if and use that enable in the bracket. So that that will mean that if there is a reset, then register will be zero. Otherwise, if there is an enable signal, it will uh, sample the input. Otherwise, it won't. So so that's how we write registers. So remember this point, register is always made by using always at pause edge clock. For rest of the values, we, we use always at static. Always at static means, uh, you can think of it as that it's always running. Whenever there is a change in input, output will be changed. But with always at pause edge clock, we, we only work on edges of the clock. Similarly, if we want to make our, an adder again, we'll use, it's a combinational circuit. Whenever there is a combinational circuit, we, always, we use always at static. So I can write C is equal to A plus B, that will make an adder. Uh, similarly, C is equal to A minus B will make a subtractor. C is equal to A multiplied by B uh, will infer a multiplier. Uh, at times, uh, we want to use, uh, most of the time that this works fine, but at times we want to specifically use some adder or multiplier from a library. So in that case, that module will be available to us and we'll use that instance of that module instead of writing A is equal to C is equal to A plus B or so on. Uh, okay, so, so the names that I have been using in these slides, A, B, C, these are not really good names. What we want is uh, that names should be a bit descriptive. Um, and naming convention is that you can use alphabets and numbers, uh, uh, but 
uh, most of the times we uh, use small alphabets because at times we are working with some old compilers which are not case sensitive and that can lead to some problems at times. Uh, basically, Verilog is case sensitive, but uh, but with hardware tools, uh, we at times go, uh, have to go to the uh, compilers that are not uh, case sensitive. Okay, so uh, just keep in mind that whenever you want to make an add -on or subtractor, you should know that uh, uh, to be safe, that uh, if you want two numbers, output should be one bit greater than that. For multiplying two numbers, the output size uh, will be doubled. Uh, and we can avoid that if we already know that input, input uh, output will remain, always remain in the range, then, then we can make it whatever we want okay so one thing that i haven't covered is how will we declare these variables so these variables can be declared as reg or wire uh, so so this reg is kind of a, an idiosyncrasy in verilog uh, if i had been making verilog i would have uh, used only one type maybe wire uh, there was no need for reg so don't confuse reg with register. It has nothing to do with register. Uh, whenever we assign something in an always block, for example, always at static or always at pause edge clock, the thing that is assigned, I'm not talking about on the right side, but the things on the left side, this has to be declared as a reg. So in this case, this is a purely combinational circuit. There is no register, but I have to declare C reg because this procedural assignment that is always the static kind of assignment that means that uh, I have to uh, declare it as reg. There is another way to make the same circuit that I haven't covered that is use of assign statement. So assign is also, uh, if I write assign C is equal to A plus B, it will also make the circuit. But uh, in assign, we can all, only have one statement. In always uh, at static, we can write begin and, and we can have multiple statements. So in assign, we, we all, only have one statement. And in that case, if I use assign to assign value, uh, some value to C, then this C needs to be declared as wire. Practically, this code and this code means exactly the same thing. This reg, and remember, this reg doesn't mean register. If I really want to make a register at the output of uh, adder, then I have to put this always at pause edge clock in a non-blocking statement here. That will mean that this is a registered output uh, of header. If I use always the static, it, there is no difference. What about A and B? I, I told you that on the left side, whatever is assigned, uh, it has to be declared as uh, reg if it's an always block or a uh, wire if it is an assigned block. So what about A and B? So A and B will be reg if, uh, so A, A and B will be coming from some other piece of code and in that piece of if that piece of code is an always block then a needs to be a reg if that piece of code is uh, an assigned statement then a needs to be a wire okay uh, so now we'll cover what are uh, so we we have covered all the basic building blocks how we write code for them uh, and so what what we do normally in hardware design is we make a design diagram uh, and we code all the building blocks. It doesn't matter in what uh, sequence we code them. Uh, we just name all the wires in the design. Uh, we declare the module and port list. And we start coding logic elements one by one. Uh, we just need to code everything. We don't need to uh, take care of any sequence. Uh, we, we, we just need to cover everything. And uh, normally what I do is while I'm coding, I start I keep declaring variables on the fly. So writing backlog code is a very simple thing if you know the syntax. Uh, so in few, uh, if we write that a few times and it just becomes a uh, simple process. The main thing is uh, coming up with a design. After that, we can just, it's a dumb process to write a code. So let's do an example uh, in which we'll write a, uh, write the code. So here is the incrementer decrementer counter that we made for FIFO. Uh, so if I want to make a module of this, what should I do? So I first of all needs to uh, label all the wires that, that are in the design. Then I need to create a file counter.v. 
and in that file I can write inputs and outputs. Um, most of the times clock and reset are implicit. We normally don't show it in the design that this is a clock or a reset. We know that if there is a register, it will have a clock and uh, mostly registers have reset. Uh, if we can, uh, if we know that we don't need a reset, we can initialize it to zero value, but uh, avoid the reset. It helps at times, but most of the times there will be a reset and clock. So uh, we can see that we have increment, decrement, count, and clock and reset as input. Uh, count is output. So uh, ignore the reg for the moment here. Uh, just assume that it's output three down to zero count. Uh, now I can start coding one by one. I can start from wherever I want. So I will start with this register. So uh, this is this gate. This is a OR gate. Uh, uh, pause for a moment and think about it. How do we write code for an OR gate? For an OR gate, we use all wizard static and we use the OR symbol. So that's that's the code. So this name is enable. We are ORing increment and decrement. So we use all wizard static, increment or decrement. Since this is just one line, so just like in C, we don't need begin and if there is only one statement. Uh, and then we can think whether we need to decrement some, uh, we need to declare something or not. Increment and decrement are already uh, declared. Uh, I need to declare enable. What should be enabled declared as wire or reg? It should be declared as reg because it's an always block. It's not a register, but it's an always block. That's why we, uh, we are assigning it an always block. So I need to declare it as a reg. Next, I want to code that mux. How do we write code for mux? We write always that static in case and case. So we write always a static case in case and if the select line is increment, if increment is zero, we want to decrement it. If it's one, we want to increment it. We could have used terms increment out and decrement out and then we could have written code for decrement out is equal to count plus one and increment out is equal to count, uh, sorry, count minus one and increment out is equal to count plus one. But um, what I have written is that I have written this incrementer and decrementer in the same block. So max out is equal to this is max out is equal to if it's zero increment is zero then uh, count minus one. If increment is one then that is we want to increment it then it's count plus one. So actually we have coded max as well as these two uh, incrementer and decrementers. Again, we need to declare this mux out, and since it's a always block in which we we are assigning it, so we have to declare it as a reg. Next, we are only left with this register, and this register. How how do we write code for a register? For register, we use always add pause clock, and do this register need an enable? Yes, it does. So if there is an uh, if reset, we want to reset it to zero. Otherwise. If there is enable, we want to uh, store max out in that uh, register. So that's, that's this hash one you can ignore for the moment. Uh, that is something that we used to write for modeling setup and whole time in register, but you can ignore it for the moment. So when we write that, now we need to think about it whether we have declared it or not. So count is output. So we have already declared it as output. Since this is an always statement, we also need to put this reg here because we are assigning in an always block. Okay, so if, if if it has been in uh, an assigned statement, then we did we didn't need to put the put this stretch here. Okay. Um, one thing that I would want to cover, I'll go back a bit where we did the counter example and push pop thing. Uh, go back. Okay. So here we were using this instance here. So when we are instantiating something that we instantiate a module uh, in another module, then all the outputs should be tied to a wire. That that's also something that you should note that uh, that push and pop needs to be uh, the push and pops are inputs. So they can be anything. Depends uh, whether uh, in the code I have uh, written push as uh, in an always block or uh, assigned block, 
uh, that will determine whether it's a reg or a wire. But for the outputs, so count is output of this module. That output will always need to be a wire because we cannot assign it in this module because it's output of this counter. So we have to use wire here. So that's something that I should have told. Okay, so last thing in this block is about arrays. I'll just quickly go back to the example and arrays. We can also use uh, arrays in our design. Uh, for example, if uh, I want to co uh, write code for the FIFO that we designed, so I can write it this way. If it's a 32 bit input, then I'll write 31 down to 0, FIFO edges. And then after that, I'll, I'll uh, write about depth of the FIFO. Normally, we write 0 to 3 if it's 4 bit, uh, 4, uh, 4 deep. If it, uh, it was more deep, then we can change this 3. Uh, and that that's how we write the edges. Just like in C, we, uh, we write int something, and then we write a number. So instead of a number, we write 0 to something. And instead of int, we specify explicitly what is the width of that uh, variable. We can use it in two ways. For example, if we want to read the value uh, from from that. So if I write a is equal to 5, 4 edges in um, 0, that means that I want to read the first register of 32-bit byte. If I write uh, something like this, that 0, 15 down to 0, that means I want to read for, uh, 16. LSBs of uh, zero register, uh, so that's how we write. Uh, similarly, if we want to write on per 16 LSBs uh, of register zero, I, I can write this. So, uh, so the first number will be telling which uh, reg register number I'm talking about, and the next will be telling about this the the bits that that I'm interested. In. Uh, I'll also want to cover alternate syntax for marks. If I have used an array, then for example, if I write data out is equal to 5, 4 edges, and then in square brackets, I write address. This effectively means that I'm making a max with address as a select line that is selecting between all the edges and connecting it to outputs. So at times, writing using arrays makes code more compact uh, that, that I generally like. Okay, so I'll stop here and we'll cover verification in the next. So in this section, we'll be covering logic verification. Uh, we have already covered uh, Verilog for senses in which we, if we have a, a design diagram available, how, I, how we can write Verilog code for that. A logic for simulation or logic veri ver verification uh, is uh, I want to think of it as a totally different way of writing Verilog from 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 writing code for senses. For senses, we just stick to the uh, exact same syntax that we we have covered uh, most of the times. But for verification, we can take a bit of liberty and we can write software style code. Uh, so so what we do uh, for verification is that suppose you have a circuit that you want to test. We normally call it module under test or device under test or unit under test. Uh, just like you uh, put it, uh, put a, an IC on a breadboard and you give it some inputs and monitor it out, its output. That that's what we want to do, but we want to do it using using some software code. So uh, this code won't be used to actually implement the design, but it is a very important code uh, because most of the bugs will be found out by writing this test bench code, uh, which is very important. So for test bench, um, we, we generally generate inputs for our block and we monitor the outputs. That's the most basic test bench that we'll be covering it. For more advanced test benches, we generally have some already available reference outputs or a DUT model. For example, I want I have made my own, let's say I have made my own optimized multiplier, then I can use a model using static uh, and then see whether for, for a lot of inputs, almost all the inputs do, uh, do my outputs match. 
So if there is a model, then we can give same inputs to model as well as to the device under test and monitor the outputs. If there is not a model but reference outputs are available, then we can compare it with the reference outputs. So for example, I want to test the counter that we uh, wrote code for. And uh, so if we want to uh, write uh, a test bench for it, so test bench is also a module, but it's a special module that doesn't have any inputs or outputs because this is uh, because test bench itself is input to the design and monitors the output. So we instantiate the module that we want to test. For example, we want to test counter. So we instantiate it. Then there are some inputs and there are some outputs. Generally, uh, we declare the input sets as regis and always we declare the outputs as wire. So this I already told you that whenever we instantiate a module, the outputs uh, are tied to whatever variable that has to be a wire. It cannot be a reg. But inputs can be reg or wire depending on how we want to make them. But most of the time we make it reg. Uh, because we want to use a procedural assignment for uh, assigning these. Then what we want to do is that we want to generate that inputs uh, that, that will be given to this uh, module. Uh, okay, So we want to generate these inputs and we want to uh, monitor the output. Uh, so basically we can imagine that we want to generate a clock signal and then we want to assert reset for a while so that system is in a known state and we want to increment for a while and decrement for a while and based on that for example i increment it twice and decrement it once so what i expect is that before reset we don't know what the value count will have so we can uh, show it by x but as soon as we get a reset on a rising edge of a clock it should get to zero and when at this rising edge of a clock, in increment is one, so count should be incremented by one. At this rising edge of a clock, again increment is one, so it should be incremented to two. One zero is two. Uh, binary in binary we write one zero, uh, and then we have uh, in the next clock cycle we have decrement, so it should decrement back to one. So uh, this is the kind of thing that we want to do in the test bench. So how do we do that? For example, I want to generate a clock. So there is a block called initial block that is normally used for simulations for test benches. So initial is, uh, is a block uh, that runs only once. So uh, what we do here is we write initial begin end and we write clock is equal to zero and forever hash five clock is equal to not of clock. So what does this mean? Forever is an infinite loop, just like a for loop or while one loop. We can also write while one, but forever is a more neat loop for that. So we need that it will always uh, do this thing. And what will it do? Hash five means that we want to insert delay for five ticks. So a simulation, every simulation has some ticks. So we don't need to go into ticks at the moment, but whatever tick it is, we want five simulation ticks. After that, we want clock to be toggled that if clock was zero, then it should be one now. And after five ticks, it should be again zero. And after five ticks, it will be toggled again to one. So we'll have this kind of a uh, signal that, that will uh, toggle after every five ticks. So overall, after every 10 ticks, it will repeat itself. OK, so forever I've covered, hash five I've covered. So initial is a C style block executing statements sequentially. Uh, unless we move forward in time using hash something or uh, add something, for example, we'll use add pause edge clock or we can use add some other signal, pause edge other signal as well. Uh, and we can use also wait statement that I won't cover in this uh, talk. So, uh, so to generate these signals, what we do is that uh, we think of these signals, uh, the time is going from left to right but we code it from top to down. For example, we write another initial block. There can be multiple initial blocks. You can think of it as just like C, a main main uh, function in C, but we can have multiple of those and all of them will be running in parallel. 
So unlike uh, always block, which is always running, initial block runs only once and uh, it runs sequentially. So we want all these signals to be zero at start. So we start increment, decrement, and reset to be zero. After that, I I want to assert reset at some time after a pause edge clock. So uh, here I have written at pause edge clock and reset is equal to one. This actually means that it will be uh, assigned to reset at pause edge clock, but it will apply at one tick delay. So, uh, so th th this means that at this pause edge clock, after a tick of one, reset will be one. Normally, we assert si uh, signals not exactly on pause edge clock, but after uh, one tick or two ticks. Uh, so, uh, because uh, th that's why normally inputs are coming from some other registers and they have some setup and hold time. Uh, so now from here to here, there is no change in the signal. We can see that. But uh, after one clock cycle, we want reset to be zero. There is only one change. So whenever there is a change, we have to code that change. So uh, so we want to spend another pause edge clock. And now we want reset to be zero. So after that, we want to spend another pause edge clock. But now we don't want to change reset, but we want to increment. Uh, yeah, we assert increment signal. So again, we can uh, pass time by having at pause edge clock, and then we use uh, we can increment uh, we can set increment to one. Here I have used a bit of different syntax that I actually prefer, but I just told you the, the, the previous syntax earlier. Here I have used at pause edge clock semicolon. That means that do nothing. Semicolon is a null statement that just end one clock cycle. So we'll come from here to here. And then after that, I have set hash one. That means just pass one tick more. And then I have said increment is equal to one. So that will have exactly the same effect. Uh, if, even if I have written this kind of a statement or this kind of a statement, if I haven't used semicolon and I had used non-blocking statement, it will have the same meaning in this case. So, but this, uh, this index I normally prefer. Then I want to uh, spend two clock cycles instead of one. So one way is that I write at pause edge clock semicolon twice. But normally, I, if I want to spend multiple clock cycles, I use this loop. This is also another neat loop. Repeat two means repeat twice at pause edge clock. That means um, at pause edge clock semicolon means that uh, do nothing and uh, spend one clock pause edge. Uh, amount of time. So uh, wait, go to the next pause edge clock and do nothing and go to the next clock as edge clock and do nothing. This can, uh, this is a constant too. Uh, we can also have variables here. So repeat is a loop just like for loop, but it's more neat if we know that we just want to repeat something n, n number of time. That's it. So uh, since I have written two, so though two clock cycles will be passed. After that, uh, we want to do two things here. We want to transition increment to zero and we want to transition decrement to one. So we have done that. We have uh, put increment equal to zero and we have put decrement equal to one. Uh, after that, we want to uh, spend another uh, clock cycle. So just, I, and after that, I want to uh, put decrement to zero. And that's probably it, but I don't want to stop exactly there. I want to spend some more clock cycles to see whether uh, there is no normality in the circuit. There is some unknown output in the circuit. So normally what we do is we spend a few more clock cycles, like repeat 20 at pause edge clock. So I spend 20 pause edge clocks. And after that, I can stop the simulation using not a stop. Uh, so this is how we write test bench. Uh, in some of the uh, tools, instead of dollar stop, dollar finishes, uh, dollar finishes used to stop the simulation. Uh, and some tools we use dollar stop. In some older variants, uh, uh, in addition to that, if you want to display output at console, then we have this printf like statement. We call it dollar display. It's similar to printf, except that we don't have to put slash in at the end if we want to display the value of count. We can say that count is equal to percent D and then we put count then it will display the value of count. So uh, so we can use these displays as well. 
and to uh, see different values. Uh, in fact, we also can use dollar printf, dollar f printf, if we want to write a file. But I won't be covering that in this uh, tutorial because this is a basic tutorial. Uh, in some older uh, tools, uh, if we want to see this waveform, we have to dump the waveform. So for dumping waveform, we use dollar dump file, and, and then we give uh, give the name to the file that we want to store these signals in. And to store the signals, we use dump vars, that means dump variables. Uh, and here we put the name of the uh, module that we want to dump signals of. For example, if, want, if I want to uh, dump signals of test bench only, then I'll write tb. And this variable is actually depth. So one means that only dump the signal of test bench. If I write two, it will also uh, dump the signal of counter as well. So that will increase the, the size of the file, but uh, but it will have more signals. So these signal uh, signal views are very useful while debugging. If things are not working, we want to see. Uh, the in the simulation. The purpose of this uh, test match is to find bugs uh, by uh, by using these simulations before we go to the synthesis step. When we synthesize design and put it on FPGA, we can't see things that easily. So that's why uh, we have these test matches. So in a nutshell, uh, we uh, did three steps. We uh, initialized, instantiated our uh, device under test. That in this case it was a counter. Then we generated clock. Then we write a main style simulation in which we uh, we uh, asserted signals from top to down as if the time was moving from left to right. And if we do it right, uh, then we can see the waveforms uh, using a tool uh, that that supports generating waveform. So generally, what tools are available uh, if you're using Xilinx or Terra FPGA, I think Xilinx, latest tool is Rivado, earlier it was Xilinx and ISC. Both have uh, their own simulators that can be used to simulate things. Uh, similarly, uh, with Altera or Intel FPGAs, Model Sim is provided, which is a third party software, which is also uh, commonly used. Uh, for, for learning purposes, and uh, if you have a if you don't want to use uh, GBs of space uh, by installing Xilinx Avado, its setup is probably around 17 or 18 GBs and it will take 13 GB of disk space. And, uh, so if you want to avoid that, you can use some free small footprint simulators like uh, Icarus Verilog and uh, some online simulators are also available. If you go to edfplayground.com, then you can uh, simulate using Icarus Verilog as well. Uh, for writing code, I prefer uh, you can write in any uh, in these IDs. You can write code in the ID that has editor as well. But if you, uh, uh, but I generally prefer Notepad plus plus. It's also a small footprint free software uh, that can be used, and it is uh, pretty strong, especially uh, uh, column mode and macros that I uh, use uh, very frequently. So I'll I'll be uh, using. Uh, Icarus very long for the rest of this uh, tutorial. So uh, if you already have Vivado or uh, installed, I won't be covering EDA Playground, but you can go to edaplayground.com uh, and then try things out. It's very similar to Icarus and there is a uh, tutorial available online that I'll put a video link uh, in the description. Uh, also to install a car is very log, I'll, I'll put a link in the description, but if you want to use Vivado or ModelSim, I won't be covering ModelSim, but I will put another video uh, with uh, using Vivado, uh, simulation using Vivado as well. So you can skip this uh, rest of the video if you don't want to use iVerilog, but uh, uh, otherwise you can follow it. So if you want to follow Icarus Verilog, you can go to Icarus Verilog download and we'll, we'll have some page that from there you can download and install it. Uh, and once it's installed, uh, it's generally uh, a bin file. Uh, uh, so, sorry, it, it just, uh, for example, I think it should be in my, um, if I go see, I very log. So this, this is where it will be installed. So, uh, so you can run it from here. 
uh, from the bin directory but it's better if you can uh, set up the environment variables uh, you can go to properties and uh, advanced system settings environment variables and in the path variable uh, you can see that i have added these two paths because i have installed in c i where log bin uh, uh, i where log in c so i am using c i where log bin and for wave of where uh, there is also another gtk wave folder and then and there's a bin folder so if i add this to path that uh, that will help me run verilog from um, from command prompt uh, without uh, without going to the exact folder uh, where it is installed so you can set it up like this way i'll, I'll link a, a video or uh, some video which installs this uh, ikaras verilog okay so now i want to cover an example so i think i have an example somewhere here i just have no. let me see i think i just made a Okay, so I have this uh, uh, I've made these two very log files in Notepad++. This is the same file that we had for, for our counter uh, that we covered and this is another file that is the test bench that we have written. So in iVerilog or Icarus Verilog we have this uh, uh, we have to use this dump file and dump was to dump things. I have also added a display here to uh, display the count value. So what we do is that, uh, for example, uh, I have made a folder named counter and I have written this code here. Uh, what you can do is you can launch command from here or PowerShell here. So I will press shift key and then right click that will enable this open PowerShell window here. So that, that opens this PowerShell window here. So here if I write I dialog, so it will give me options how to give files or things. So what I want to do is that uh, I want to compile uh, all these files. So there are only two files, so I'll just type I dialog static dot uh, I can also uh, give uh, output name. Uh, by default, if I don't give any output name, it will still uh, compile them uh, but uh, if i want to uh, give output uh, some name so i can write minus o followed by the name like uh, tv counter and then static dot c so now if you see in the folder i have this tv counter so to run this simulation, so uh, this only compiles it. To run this simulation, we have to write uh, vpp space and the name of the file. Okay, we don't have to necessarily put it. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, let me see it again. Okay, I'll, I'll have BVP instead of BVP. So I will use. Okay, so here you can see that uh, we have this uh, count is equal to 2 printed, which is a promising sign. So, and also we have this waveform.vcd file created because in our uh, code we gave this name to the file. If I want to see the waveform, so I I have to write if I remember correctly GTK wave. So GTK wave is the other path that we had given. So this this is the waveform where here we can open any waveform file. So here I am using this GTK wave dot VCD file. And what I can do is that I can add all signals and append it here. So it will just confirm it 
and here you can see that uh, this this button will zoom fit that is it will fit uh, the whole simulation in uh, in one window and if i want to zoom it on something i just click there and just zoom so initially uh, count value was x because we didn't know what it would be before reset but it, at this pause clock we asserted this reset that resulted in count value to be zero on the next pause clock since increment was one it went from zero to one and then it was again one for next uh, clock cycle and it became, became two uh, sorry I just went too far ahead and then in the next clock cycle uh, we asserted the decrement signal. So here's the decrement signal we asserted it here. Uh, at that time, the value was 0, 1, 0, that is 2. But at this rising edge of clock, we had this decrement 1. So it went back to 1. So this is working fine. Uh, we can also change the data formats. For example, if you want to uh, see it as decimal, I can have a des uh, to see, I can set it to decimal. So now you can see 0, 1, 2, and 1. Uh, uh, if, if it hadn't worked fine in the first go, I would like to see inside the uh, inside the value, inside the UUT, whether the increment is asserted or not. Since I uh, I in the in the code I have set this value to one, it is only showing one level deep signals. So if I set it to two instead that then it will also show TB counter signals as well as one module deep that is any module that is instantiated in TB counter. So if I compile again, so let me clear it and so I compile it again and then I run it again and uh, now waveform is again outputted so I just run the waveform here and now I open the VCD file so now you can see this plus sign here and you can see that UUT is also there so UUT is the name of module if, if you go into the code I have named, named this module as unit under test so if I want to add all the signals I can uh, this recurse import means that it will add all the signals so if I add them, all the signals will be added. Uh, I can select one signal and append as well. So I can, if I don't want to see all the flutter signals, then I can use one by one as well. But in this case, I wanted to add all the signals. Now these are test bench signals, clock, count, uh, increment, decrement, reset. And these signals, which also include enable and max out, these signals are uh, from inside this UUT module. So this was recursive and append, so it also added uh, signals from UUT as well. Okay, so this way, uh, these waveforms are the main source which which uh, which are our, uh, which help us when when things are stuck. When if if I don't get count correctly, then I'll go back to the design diagram and I'll see. From where count is coming. Count is coming from max out. So I'll see whether max out is correct or not, whether enable signal of register is coming correctly or not, and then that will help me identify where the bug is. So that's uh, it for the simulation and verification. Uh, I'll, I'll cover another, uh, make another video for Vivado based uh, simulation. Uh, now I'll be covering uh, simulation flow using uh, Vivado. Uh, we already covered with iVerilog, but if you have already uh, installed Vivado, then you can use Vivado for simulation instead of uh, I, uh, installing iVerilog. Uh, in Vivado, uh, first thing we do is uh, there are multiple ways to do that, but, but generally what we do is that we create a new project. Uh, we give it a name for example i will give it a name maybe counter project uh, let i'll create it on my desktop uh, and it's an rtl project 
if you already have some files then you can add them there but i'll, I'll just add new files next uh, we don't need to add the student files because we are just uh, simulating uh, normally we select some board here but uh, since we are just simulating this so we don't need to select any board as well so that's it this this will create a project an empty project nothing in it except uh, the project file then let it stop so once the project is created we can add uh, this, add new files so i can add source uh, add or create design source okay uh, and i want to create a file and i want a very a very long module so i'll just name it counter okay and i'll just finish uh, we can uh, give port names and inputs here but uh, i won't do it i'll just i prefer uh, using an empty file so here's the counter module uh, i'll just copy paste the code from uh, from the slides that we used so i'll just should paste everything with this code so this is the counter that we designed so maybe if i can okay so next thing i uh, if uh, i want to add some test page to simulate so i'll add source again and again i will create new file here uh, there are options like verilog and vatl i just want verilog and the right tv counter uh, which is the test bench so i'll just create that file uh, i don't want to give any inputs or outputs at the moment and that's it so now i have a tv counter dot v as well so I'll just copy paste the code from the counter that we covered in the slides. Uh, so I'll just replace it. Uh, when we are using Verilog, uh, uh, using uh, Bivado, we don't need to use dump bars or uh, dump files. So I'll just replace it, uh, delete it, and then I'll come to also we can use dollar stop instead of dollar finish but i don't think that that will make any difference i'll keep it that way so that's it that's that's uh, uh, that's how we add files and uh, so uh, the auto automatically updates it and it uh, has recognized that we have a top level uh, simulation file tv counter and then we have a, a test page so uh, to simulate the design we select the test bench file and we just run simulation so run behavioral simulation it will start the simulation and now you can see that it has run it and it is stopped at dollar finish and if we look at the waveform we can see the signals we can zoom out uh, this will uh, zoom to full view and i can see that uh, initially maybe i can make it a bit bigger like that so initially uh, we had a reset after reset uh, i should zoom in a little uh, at this pause clock we had a reset and uh, the count goes to zero uh, after that when well, on this pause clock uh, was the first time that we uh, got uh, we had increment is equal to one so counter value incremented from zero to one and then it was again incremented and it went to two on this pause clock we had a decrement so it got, got back to one so this way we can actually uh, simulate using uh, rewardo and uh, uh, at times when things don't work out uh, we need to debug it at the uh, here we can only see the signals from the test bench but if we want to see the signals of uh, counter so counters module name was uut uh, if, if i uh, see the test bench code you can see that the instance name was uut so this uut is, means that it's the counter i can add 
this two waveform view and here you can see the signals are added but you can see that we can't see the signals here if we want to to uh, see those signals we have to restart the simulation uh, you can actually do uh, this from here and rerun again so or you can uh, type in the uh, console so if i let's say do it here then you can see that here the command was given restart so you can write restart here and it will do the same thing so restart restarts everything and then if you run all it, it just runs till it encounters a dollar stop or dollar finish so in this case it's dollar stop so here you can up for some reason okay let me see why 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 aren't the signals here maybe because of dollar finish let me see if i change it to dollar stop i don't think it should work actually but so if i change the code i have to run simulation again so i'll run the simulation again So it's probably because uh, uh, because I uh, encountered dollar finish and it just ended the simulation. If it had been dollar stop, then we can uh, rerun the simulation. So uh, when I rerun the simulation, it asked me whether I want to save the waveform file. This this these symbols, and I said yes. So uh, because it needed to close existing simulation so it just closed the existing simulation and rerun the whole simulation again uh, and now you can see that these signals are there so now you can see the signals from inside uh, the UUT as well um, you can add dividers here for example if I want to have a divider I can say that UUT signals and this clock is from inside UUT, so I have a need divided that these are test bench signals and these are UUT signals. And if the thing had not been working properly, if we let's say counter was not implemented, then I I could have seen why it's not working. I could have seen why uh, whether uh, max out value is correct or not, whether enable is correct or not. These are the signals that were actually. Uh, input to uh, the count register and enable of the count register so the, these values uh, will give me a chance to backtrace and that's the main reason we use uh, simulations so that's it that that's how we simulate in uh, record in this video we'll be discussing the process of census uh, we have discussed how to simulate barrel of designs and uh, since this is the step after that uh, and we basically want to test out our logic on FPGA and uh, doing that is called census. So uh, basically uh, what we want to do is that we have a design available uh, that we have verified in simulation and we are confident that it will be running but it has to be uh, transferred onto to an FPGA. Uh, we call it burning it on FPGA. Uh, uh, and but but there are some things to do before that. So basically, FPJ uh, uh, would be in form of some board uh, that we have available. So we'll have to buy some board and try it on that. Uh, and that board will be connected to different interfaces uh, depending on the design. Uh, we might want to communicate it through a, a communication link, and maybe we want to sample some data using ADCs. We want to maybe see the status of some things on LEDs, uh, maybe connected to push buttons. Uh, this is a poor design, <laughs> poor diagram for a push button, but anyway. Uh, and we want to also, uh, might also want to connect it to some expansion connector with pins going out to some other board. So these are pins if, uh, if they're looking, not looking like uh, pins, it's my fault. So uh, forgive me for my drawing. So basically what we want to do is we want to assign pins to ports and uh, ask the tool, uh, tool uh, to do the rest. So basically that's what we do. 
So, uh, so the tool then synthesizes the Verilog code, translates it, maps it, and plays and routes it. Uh, all of that is done automatically, uh, and it can optimize for clock and area. We we can change a few settings for for that. And then we generate a programming file, and that file is actually programmed onto the FPGA. Uh, after that, we just connect the programming cable to the FPGA and try it out. So that's that's the main thing. So uh, how to assign pins to the FPGA? FPGA pins are generally numbered like A1, A2, A3, A4, or A1, A2, B1, A8, or something like that. And we want to tell uh, the tool that this specific pin needs to be connected to this specific signal in our design so that is done in a constraint file uh, normally in vivado it uh, has extension xdc in earlier variants of uh, xilinx isc uh, it's uh, it has an extension ucf for uh, user constraint file xdc probably stands for xilinx design constraints so uh, if you're using Altera, then uh, it will be some other name, but then there you, you will also have some constraint file to, for the same purpose. Uh, XTC, uh, in XTC, we can um, give uh, different kind of constraints, but most common are two type of constraints. One is, uh, uh, first one is the, uh, the constraint that connects a specific pin to our uh, uh, signal name in the top level uh, Verilog code and that is uh, uh, this constraint so we what we do is now this constraint is connecting uh, this port named clock uh, to this package pin so this L16 is the FPGA pin that we want to connect the clock to so we already need to know somehow that uh, on which pin we we, uh, we are expecting clock uh, so uh, I'll shortly tell how how can we know that. So uh, the second type of constraint is a, a period constraint. So uh, for clock signals, this is for clock signals. So basically, uh, in an XTC file, there are many uh, uh, statements like the first one uh, in which we connect all the signals, and then there uh, there are a few uh, statements like this, uh, which basically provide the clock constraint. So this uh, constraint is telling uh, the tool that we have a clock of a period of 8 nanoseconds with a waveform that it will remain low for first 4 nanoseconds and it will go high after 4 nanoseconds. So basically 50% uh, of the time duty cycle is as such. And, and this is uh, telling that uh, we need to, uh, we are looking for this port named clock uh, on which we are assigning this constraint. So this constraint will help the uh, tool uh, to have a target uh, to be able to synthesize and uh, um, so Vivado will try to synthesize it and if uh, the resultant design that we have made uh, can satisfy this constraint of uh, uh, of having uh, uh, of maximum delay of 8 nanoseconds before uh, between different clock cycles then it will tell us that timing has been met Otherwise, it will tell, tell us that timing has not been met and it will tell us about uh, by which margin it has not been met. So that's what we want to do. So we'll go back to the design that we covered in the uh, first or second lecture. So uh, we made a counter uh, which was used for increment and decrement and we uh, wrote Verilog code for that. So and now uh, we want to connect it to the FPGA. So basically, uh, we have these inputs. Uh, increment and decrement and uh, output count. We also have clock and reset as input. So uh, these inputs and outputs we want to connect. So uh, right now I have this board named Zebo, uh, which which I'll be uh, for which I'll be synthesizing uh, the design, and I want to test out my logic of counter. So uh, first of all, I need to connect things. So uh, I can see that on this board I have four push buttons. So I can connect one of them to reset, another to increment, another to decrement. Clock will be automatically connected. So it's off the shelf board. It already has uh, connections made. So there is a crystal on board from where we uh, derive the clock and that clock is connected to some FPGA pin that we'll shortly see. And for output, I 
I have I can see it on maybe LEDs. I have four LEDs, so I can connect the count to the, those four LEDs. Then I can. It would have been better if uh, I could see it on a maybe seven segment display, but there isn't any, so we can uh, look at it uh, on the LEDs in binary form, zero, one, two, three. Anyway, binary is good for logic designers, so we don't mind them. Uh, the only problem we have is switch bouncing. So, uh, that whenever we press this switch, uh, these are mechanical switches, and when they um, uh, get back uh, up, uh, when we uh, release the switch, it uh, it also uh, it bounces multiple times. So we get on signal multiple times. Uh, the design was expecting that increment will be a single cycle pulse. Uh, that will be on for one cycle and decrement will be a single cycle pulse. So if I press uh, the button, uh, it will not only uh, be turned on for a, for a long period of time, uh, so incrementing counter many times, but it will also bounce up and down and it will uh, 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 be on multiple times. So we want to resolve this. So or to resolve this, we can actually have a uh, what we call is a debounce circuit. So basically, I've made a small change in the design. I'll add that debounce circuit in increment and decrement paths. I don't uh, worry about reset because even if reset bounces, it doesn't matter because in the end, it will just reset the system. But I want to increment and decrement. I want to increment it only once when I uh, push the button and I only want to decrement it only once when I push the button. So I have made a small circuit that actually uh, is enabled whenever there is a one on increment and for uh, a programmed number of cycles uh, it doesn't uh, look at the input anymore it just waits for a while uh, till everything is settled down and after that it actually increments so uh, so that's uh, how it's handled uh, in our logic so I'll uh, switch to the uh, to the Vardo and show you how to uh, do that. So in Rewardo, if I want to implement it, I'll create a new project. Project. I don't know. It's taking a lot of time for some reason. Okay. So maybe I want to see test the counter. And next, I want to make a RTL project. Uh, and I don't want to add any files at this moment or not any constraints. Uh, I'll add them later. Uh, next thing is that I want to select the part number. So in Rewardo, we can actually select the board as well. So I'll do that. I'll just uh, type in Zego here. And this board and use finish okay it will automatically create the project uh, I've created it on desktop and since I have selected the board so Xilinx already know, knows this board uh, and it will uh, know the exact part number of the FPGA uh, and it will select it automatically Next thing is that I want to add my sources. So first of all, I want to add uh, my counter files. So uh, okay, so I'll just create a design file and I'll say is a create file. It's saying Verilog. So I want to write it Verilog. So counter and Okay, it's asking me whether I want to add some input and outputs, but I generally prefer writing it in code because it takes lesser time. So it will just create it. So that's our counter dot p that uh, say. So it's an empty module. If I had added some inputs or outputs, it, it would have been here. Uh, now I want to copy paste my code, so I think here it is, hopefully, 
okay so this is the same code just i have added uh, added this module of the bounce uh, at start of it uh, not in the start in, in uh, with increment and decrement so i'll just move it and paste it so this is my code so i also need to have this module here so i can either add this file so uh, i can add the sources as well uh, but i'm just uh, for the person who is, who is writing for the first time he'll probably uh, uh, would want to write code so i added a new file otherwise if we already have the source files we can add those so i have pasted the module of the bounce here as well so here we have both things ready so this is the first thing that we already know uh, how to add uh, files to a project but but the main thing is that uh, we also need to uh, to connect the pins in in an xdc file so where uh, first of all where to get that xdc file so um, whatever board you, are, you have bought it uh, normally the vendor gives you a master xdc file so if i search it on google here is the page for zebo and uh, here uh, you can see master xdc file if i click click it it will open this uh, github page where they have uh, uh, xdc files for all uh, the boards from vigilant uh, that is the vendor i've already um, downloaded it you can download the file and i have extracted it so here i have that those xdc files so here if i open this uh master xdc this is the file so uh, if you can read here it says that uncomment the lines corresponding to the use pins so what whatever i want to connect so here uh, we were discussing that we want to connect clock reset increment decrement and count with these uh, pins so i can see that here is the first signal is the clock signal so i can copy it and now i can add source but this time i'll uh, select add or create constraints and um, i can say that create file uh, you can see that it's saying xtc so i can name it counter and finish so here in the constraints we have now one file and i can open it up and i can copy paste the clock signal so since i've copied it from uh, zebo uh, master xdc so we already know that this pin number is correct uh, and it has a period of uh, 125 megahertz 8 nanoseconds translate to 125 megahertz uh, so if you want to verify it you can also go to the vendors user manual that has provided for example here is the reference manual of uh, zebo board and it tells us that it has external 125 megahertz clock at pin l16 so we can see that uh, the same pin is connected in the, uh, in, the in the master x we see that we copy paste copy paste next we want uh, push buttons so here are the push buttons so we want three of them for reset uh, increment and decrement so I'll just copy it and paste it. I personally prefer using uh, Notepad++, but this editor is also reasonably okay. Uh, and I don't want to uh, connect it to the port name button. I want to connect it to whatever I have used in the design. So in my design, I have used reset. It's better to copy it and paste it so that there is no spelling mistake. Uh, I want to connect the next one to increment, button one to increment, and I want to connect pin two to decrement. So three buttons are connected. We are not using the fourth one because clock is already connected. So we know that we only need three other inputs. And also I want to connect the output to the LEDs. So uh, so I have to copy and these are the four LEDs right in front of us so we just copy it here and 
you can. That's it. That's my design ready to be synthesized. So uh, now next we ask the tool to synthesize, implement and generate programming file. So if I click generate programming file, it will do all the steps. First step is synthesis, next is implement. Synthesis kind of synthesizes it uh, without actually mapping it to the exact uh, FPGA architecture. It just uses the uh, building blocks of the FPJ but not map it to exact locations. Implement design basically maps it to exact locations and try different things out to try to meet timing. Uh, and then we finally have this uh, generate bitstream actually generate the FPJ programming file that we normally call bit file. So I'll just run it. Right. It says that there is no implementation available. Do you want to run it? Yes, I want to run it. And now it will take some time, so I'll just pause the video. Okay, so I got this error here uh, while implement designing. So uh, I'll just take a look into it. I oh okay, it is saying that uh, I should have used count count as an array, so I can use it directly. So so last one was three, so I'll just. Left root again. Paste count again. Count zero. Count one. Count two. Count three. Okay. So I'll save it and again. Run it and pause the video again. Okay, so the sense is complete now. Uh, I can either open design or view reports. I will open view reports. Uh, one thing to make sure when your design is done is to look at the timing report of the design. Uh, so, for example, here it is, and I'll open it. Uh, you can, the important thing is to make sure the timing has been met. So this line is the key. All user specified timing constraints are met. So basically we just gave one timing constraint. It's a small design and we were expecting it to be met. But make it a habit to always check the, uh, the timing. If it is not met, then you should go and uh, see the timing analyzer uh, and what happened. So once you're done with it, uh, then you need to connect with board. So uh, you've seen the board diagram that I've already shown. Maybe this this is my board. Uh, it has a programming cable normal uh, that connects to the USB port. Uh, from here, this is the programming port. I will connect it to. Uh, I've already connected it to my uh, USB port of this laptop. And now what I need to do is I just need to program it so for programming it we go to uh, hardware manager and we open target auto connect we had another for it open if it doesn't make any of that. So uh, I want to program the device. It's already selected the device that we want to program, and it has already selected the uh, bit file. So uh, the the whole output of this census process is a file with extension dot bit. 
so we call it a bitstream file that that actually programs the fpj it has the same name uh, of that of project uh, of the top level file of the project so i had counter.p so it's generated counter.bit and uh, i'll just program it so when we program it there is a done led on the fpj that will uh, start to glow and now I'll, I'll move to my uh, mobile camera uh, to show you uh, what we can see there okay so i have connected this fpj board uh, and uh, programmed it so it's already reset so we, you don't see any leds now if i increment it you can see that one led is on so this is 0001 and I, then I increment it twice, I get 10, then again 113, and 1004, 1015, uh, 1106. And meanwhile, if I reset it again, I get 0. And again, I can increment 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I can also decrement it using third button. Uh, from 6 to 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 1 and 0 and obviously if I decrement beyond 0 I get minus 1 it's all 1 so if you understand 2's complement numbers it's minus 1 okay, so one last thing that is uh, about uh, uh, the specific board is that uh, uh, when I was creating the project in Avado, I was able to select this board, but uh, if you try it yourself, you might not see Zebra board there. Uh, that's because uh, the standard Xilinx boards are already there, but uh, uh, some of the Digilent boards are not by default there. So uh, to be able to see them there, uh, you need to uh, copy board files. So if you go down the page, there is a link for installing Evado uh, and Digilent board files. So this is uh, this is the page where you can uh, from where you can follow it step by step. You can download the board files and then you'll have to go to a specific directory in the in the Vivado installation and copy the board files there, and it will automatically pick those up. So that's one thing that that's specific to this board. Uh, if you're using some other board, it might already be there by default if it's not there then you might have to uh, download the board files and copy them there in this section we'll be covering um, how to write code in Verilog for straight machines uh, we won't be covering how straight machines are divided, designed in detail but we'll do uh, a few examples in case you have forgotten how to do that so uh, here is a example uh, let's say we have th three processing elements a b and c and uh, b operates on output of a c operates on output of b uh, then let's say for example a outputs in a shared ram and uh, that that output is used by b and then b performs something on the same data and that output is used for c used by c so uh, normally uh, finite state machines are used uh, to control circuits so, in, so we need a controller that that can trigger b and c uh, once a is done we can trigger b and then when b is done we can trigger c so we need a controller and we'll be designing it using uh, fsm so let's say uh, controller is started by an external start signal and when whenever there is a start signal we start a we send start signal to a a does its processing and writes its results uh, wherever it wants and then when it's done uh, it sends a done signal let's assume all these singles are single cycle pulses uh, when a is done we would want to start b and uh, B will do its processing and when, when B is done, it will send a done signal. And similarly, when B is done, we want to start C. And when C uh, does its processing, uh, it will give, it, give us a done signal. 
and that on that point will we'll, uh, generate another done signal which shows that all the processing is completed so in this uh, simple toy example we need a controller that can uh, start these process and and wait for duns so uh, normally what i prefer to do is that when i had to design, i have to design a state machine i normally write inputs and outputs uh, and then i generally write sequence of steps looking at those outputs uh, if i make if i make a sequence of steps that can be translated into state diagram uh, normally easily so for example in this case we have a global start signal then uh, we have uh, on, on 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 that signal will start a which which will be our output then we'll wait for done from a which will be our input so basically all the duns and the global start is an input and uh, this, all the starts to processors uh, are our output and final done is our output so if i write the sequence of steps it's basically this that i'll wait for start um, and do nothing until there is a global start signal and if there we have that signal we'll start a and after that we'll wait for done from a and uh, based on that we'll start b and then we'll wait for done from B, and then we'll start C, and then we'll wait for done from C, and then we'll start done. And after that, we can go to state one again uh, to wait for start again, so so that we can do the same process again. So now, if I have to translate into a state machine, first we we generally make a state diagram uh, with the circles re representing states and arrows representing state transitions. So there are two kinds of state machines. One is more state machine in which outputs are dependent on state only. So in this case, we have uh, four outputs, start A, start B, start C, and none. So initially, let's say we are in idle state. So we'll wait for uh, start. And whenever there is start, we can start A. So since output is dependent on state only, so we'll have to have a state for for this so we'll have to have a state start a so that we can assert the output start a and when we start a we wait for uh, we can we can after that we can start waiting for the done so we'll have another state wait a in which we are waiting for done from uh, from processor a uh, so we go unconditionally from start a to wait a because we just need this state for one cycle signal starting then from wait a we go to uh, we wait for done a and as soon as done a comes we transition from wait a to start b to assert the start signal of processor b and then we go back to another state uh, wait b where we'll be waiting for done b as soon as done b comes we can start c and when uh, after that we can wait for uh, done of C. One once we have done of C, we can go to state of done so that we can assert the uh, the final done signal. And after that, we can go back to idle state. So uh, because we have to have one uh, a state for each output. So in most state machine, generally there are more states. And in most state machine, on arrows uh, on these edges we only mention the input because output is not depending uh, dependent on inputs output is only a function of states only so these four states are output states rest of the states don't assert any output so so these are all required because we need these four outputs uh, on the contrary there is another uh, uh, kind of state machine called BDX machine in which outputs are dependent on state as well as inputs. So in that case, what uh, uh, what we do is we mention output on the state transitions. For example, I'm in idle and I'm waiting for start from A. So as soon as I uh, get a start from A, I assert start A signal as well. So on the left side of bar is input and on the right side of bar is output. So we don't need a separate state for starting a we'll just assert output while we are going from this state to this state now we can wait 
uh, for done in this state instead of having a start state uh, separate. So from where A, we can go to, uh, we are waiting for done from A. So as soon as we have done from A, we can start process B. So again, we assert the output in, on the same cycle and uh, we don't have to have a separate state. And similarly, when we get a done from B, we start C. Similarly, when we get a done from C, we can do, uh, we send it, we can send the done signal and go back to uh, state idle. So this way, uh, you can see that there are lesser number of states in MIDI state machine. So, so this is kind of benefit of MIDI state machine. But uh, since in MIDI state machine, uh, the main difference is that uh, the in move state machine, uh, we said that the output is only a function of uh, state. But in MIDI state machine, output also depends on input as well. So that means that there is a direct combinational path here that this one that uh, uh, that goes from input to output. Normally it is recommended that uh, we have registered output of our modules. So that's kind of the undesirable part of melee state machine. Personally, I normally prefer melee state machine and if it is required, I just add a register, uh, a separate register at the output. Otherwise, uh, mostly it doesn't make any, uh, any difference. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just, this cloud is showing combinational logic so, and this register means register. So I, I just rearrange it uh, so that uh, the register uh, state is a function of input and current state and output is also a function of current state and input. So that's what we, uh, we want to write code for. So for writing very long code, we have to write this register and then we have to write this combinational block. For writing a register, we already know that we use always at positive clock. But normally when we write code for uh, a state machine, it's better to use parameters. Parameters are, uh, uh, it makes, it's not necessary, but it makes the code more readable. And so we, uh, while reading the code, we, we know which state we are instead of figuring out from the number uh, which, which state we are. So it's just like hash defined in C. So these these are the uh, kind of constants defined in our uh, module. So we have defined idle to be 0, weight A to be 1, weight B to be 2, weight C to be 3. And uh, for making a register, we, we have four shares, so two bits are enough. So we can write always at pause clock and if on reset we can uh, set it to idle uh, otherwise I can uh, stay uh, I can have this input I can name it state underscore next I uh, will have to write some code to uh, to have this logic as well but at the moment we can just label it state underscore next uh, you can ignore these hash ones uh, for, for the moment these are not required actually so for writing this combinational cloud uh, what we do is we normally uh, uh, write a case statement and uh, we say that if current state is something then based on something we make the decisions. For example, if current state is idle and we get an input uh, start then we want to assert start A is equal to 1. So that's what we are doing that if case uh, if state is idle and if start is 1 we want to assert start A and we also want to make next state to be weight a so star a state address for next which was the input to state register will be weight a so if i write this code what does it mean it basically means that start a we are writing code for start a and it's uh, uh, it depends on uh, on case and we already know that case basically generates a mux so based on state there is a mux and if the state is idle and start signal is one, then we are asserting one. But we haven't specified uh, what will happen if start is zero. If I don't write an else, that means that I haven't specified it. So if we don't specify it, that effectively means that we want to retain the previous value. So it will assert, a, uh, it will uh, attach the current output uh, back to the input. Uh, this is called a combinational feedback and it's also called a latch 
that we never want in our circuit. So, uh, so basically, this this discrepancy is there because we haven't start, uh, uh, haven't defined here what should start a B if start signal is not there. So, in other words, there should have been uh, we should have specified that it would remain zero if if there is no start signal. You know, or in other words, we should have added this arrow in the state diagram that if there is no start then start a should be zero and this is also true for other outputs as well for example uh, uh, that i should do it for start b as well start c as well and done as well so that if there is no done from c then i should not assert uh, final done so if there is done from c then i should assert final done so i should add these small circles for better than and this is not the end of story. We haven't specified what will be the value of weight A, weight B, uh, start A. In uh, what will be the value of start A in the rest of the states as well. So if I write the code in the same way and I don't specify start A in the rest of the states, then it again there will be a combinational feedback. So one way is that I assert every output in every case statement and for every if i have uh, i put uh, put an else statement and that will effectively mean uh, that i put zero in this case for um, uh, uh, zero in rest of the cases uh, for start a similarly i should put uh, zero uh, for start b start c and done here uh, and that will effectively mean that i have to add these signals here and for every case so that also uh, that makes the code a bit cluttered and also design diagram a bit cluttered as well uh, a shortcut to uh, do the same thing is that we define default values of all outputs if we define default values of all outputs we can make uh, our design diagram uh, the, the state diagram simpler as well as uh, our code a bit simpler uh, so basically we can put start a start b start c done and state next uh, uh, we can give default values to these signals so by default state next will remain whatever the current state is and all the rest of outputs will remain zero so if i do that then i don't i don't need to put else to every if and uh, uh, by default it will automatically ensure that if i haven't connected it it's, it defaults to zero so uh, that uh, that's uh, in that way i don't need to add these signals in the state diagram as well so that will be also less cluttered so now now the coding part is easy after this uh, default values i just need to do uh, that I, for every state i just look at it what uh, at what input i want what output for example if done a is one i want start b to be one so if done a is one i want start b to be one and i want next state to be it be so this way i can write code for all of the state machine um, so that's it if you follow these guidelines then uh, you won't have any latches in your code and, uh, and it should turn fine uh, there are other uh, ways as well some people prefer uh, a separate logic for straight underscore next and separate logic for outputs but i generally prefer it this way uh, Another thing is uh, that is called one hot encoding. So uh, what what it means is that uh, the parameters that we set earlier were uh, two bit parameters, and we had state uh, two bit state. Uh, if we uh, encode it in such way that uh, we have a different bit for every state. For example, if there are four states, then we have four bit state variables. So if bit one is one, that means that we are in idle state. If bit two is one, then we it means that we are in wait state, wait a state, and so on. So every state can be identified by just one in the uh, in the state uh, register. This is called one hot encoding. This has uh, some benefits. For example, um, so if we have a state register, and what we want is we want to assert. Uh, start a start a if we are in idle state and we have a uh, we have a start signal so this can be uh, basically implemented using and and gate only uh, while uh, earlier we saw that for implementing the start a signal using uh, if we had two bits for state 
then it would have been a max uh, that that will uh, that would have been implementing this so uh, so definitely the combinational part is smaller here so if we are uh, having some timing issues in, in our design we can we can try one hot encoding and normally we don't really need to write uh, for one hot encoding always uh, the census tools allow us uh, that we we can have us uh, we have a setting inside vivado or xilinx uh, isc where we can uh, check that uh, straight machines should be implemented as one hot and it will automatically uh, do the uh, conversions uh, without our knowledge even if we haven't used one hot encoding but we should know that this this uh, this this slide shows that what benefit we have it's not for free though uh, so the logic that we have uh, 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 we have lesser logic here but we have more flip flops that are used by one hot encoding uh, so one hot is generally fast but can use more flip flop so it's a trade off uh, if we if you are short on uh, slice registers then you can uh, use uh, you, you should not use one hot encoding but if you are uh, you are short on timing then you should use uh, what if it had been a boor machine so if it had been a boor machine then we would have uh, a separate state for each uh, out uh, for output so for example we had it done a, a start a state start b state start c state and done state so in that case even this register would have been gone uh, because that bit was enough to assert the uh, start a signal because that was a separate state but again it was an uh, it had uh, additional states so that means we can add more flip flops uh, but uh, will reduce this output forming logic uh, more so uh, so basically we have uh, one hot more uh, machine is faster at the cost of more flip flop so that's that's really the trade off that we take when we uh, design uh, hardware that uh, we can trade off between speed and area and at times between flip flops and combinatorial logic so that that's basically the essence of uh, what I uh, understand about strings. Thanks.